everybody, Raul here for Bass Musician Magazine, and today we have the extraordinary honor and pleasure of chatting directly from Rome, Stefano Franceschini. Yay! Oh, yeah, man, That's, that was great. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me, man. Oh, my pleasure. So, Stefano, there's so much stuff to talk about, but as always, we want to know a little bit more about you. How did you get started in music and particularly on bass? Well, I was actually born with music, uh, almost literally, because I have two older brothers that literally brought me up with metal music. And there's also this very short, funny story I want to share with you. So when I, I wasn't even, you know, one year old, I used to eat only if my parents uh, played Metallica's one video uh, <laughs> videotape, the, the video clip, which is also, it's weird to think about it. That video is so dark and you know, this that guy is at a hospital and oh, but I wouldn't eat if uh, you know if they didn't play that <laughs> so I started very young I would say and when it comes to playing uh, I started with you know almost you know for fun with a classic guitar at the age of four or five you know just to uh, mess with it a little bit my parents just wanted to give me this uh, little present and then I started with drums but uh, you know the, the my true love, of course, was and still is bass. And that's also very interesting because um, I always wanted to learn guitar. But chances were that one of my, you know, one of my two brothers also played and still plays bass. So, and he bought this new Ibanez bass. And the, the, the very old one that he got, the I think it was a Samic. Very, like, cheap, but, you know, almost indestructible bass. And it was laying there and then, you know, in a corner of the of his bedroom, he missed the string. It, mm-hmm. it wasn't really in a very good shape. So I just, I was like, okay, let's just, I, I literally started doing this. I, I think I was 12 years old or something. Yeah. And but I, I, then I got the gist of it. And, um, you know, and, and, and then I started playing ACDC songs, mm-hmm. Maiden, and then I started switched to Metallica and Megadeth and... 20 years later, here I am, man. Yeah. So are you self-taught or did you pursue formal studies? Yeah, self-taught. I just took a few lessons for like a very short time, 15 years ago, you know, just to get like some basics. But but then I realized that I could get, you know, I could learn actually the, the same things by myself. Mm-hmm. And also, I don't really like, I mean, the teacher was great as a, as a human <laughs> being, as a person, but like, it was to his method was a little bit too random. So yeah. one day we would do slap technique, and the other one just you know song learning. It wasn't really organized, but besides that, yeah, I'm, I'm basically self taught. Yeah, got you. Well, and you're currently playing bass with Hideous Divinity, and right. this music falls in a, a kind of specific niche. And I want to make sure I don't mess this up. It's technical brutal death metal. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's a label that we kind of feel close to right now. But you know, every time people ask us, we just say that we play death metal. Mm-hmm. But I think people really want to, I'm not saying that in a negative way, that really want to stick a label on you just because they want to describe you as, you know, as well as possible mm-hmm. in order to, you know, there's so many bands and genres right now. So you, you always got to have like this three or four words to describe a genre, you know, that that, that band plays until we we'll probably get to a point that the, that specific genre exists for that specific band only. Yeah. But yeah, techno brute death metal, I think it would portray a very faithful image of the, the, the style that, that we play. I got you. Well, and the thing is with determining genres of music has become ever more difficult because of the evolution of music and and crossover. So that something that used to be very clearly one thing now is maybe a mixture of two different things or yeah. is is somewhere in between. And oh, the, yeah. the one that always, I think, probably one of the broadest definitions when you talk to people that play prog the the progressive players <laughs> you know, uh, for me well, what do you mean exactly yeah prog, i know what <laughs> yeah so for me some of watching your videos part of what i'm seeing i could go well i could see that as being prog but yeah you know, it would be correct um you know 
on a more formal level. Exactly. It definitely, it's definitely progressive in terms of key changes, structure, tempo. Exactly. Changes. So it doesn't get any more progressive than that. But of course, it definitely doesn't sound like Rush or Zappa or Dream Theater. If of course that most usual way of referring to prop music, but on a more structural level, a harmonic level, it's definitely progressive. I would say, yeah, I like that kind of definition. Well, I understand yeah. you guys are being very busy. You have a tour planned for the summer, and you're working on a new album as well. Tell us a little bit about all that. Right. So we have this summer show slash festival run. We're going to have play four shows uh, at the end of July. Then we have a couple uh, more appearances in August and also have with this Danish festival, so Raise Your Horns, in a, a, a little town and a small island in Denmark. In Denmark. Uh, just very funny the way you get to you get there because uh, you got to fly into Copenhagen, uh, take a bus, drive to Sweden, and then from Sweden take a ferry back to Denmark. But it's on a different, you know, like smaller island. Anyway, so that. And we also have a U.S. tour scheduled for September, October with Badushka and Hey. And in the meantime, yes, uh, we're also working on new music because... That's something that kind of never stops. So our unique songwriter and only songwriter in the band, Enrico, has been working on new music nonstop. So has been showing us like a few demos and ideas and riffs. And I can totally tell you already that stuff is going to sound a little more atmospheric and darker in terms of, you know, general vibes. You know, I'm taking as a point of reference our latest EP, which is very movie-like cinematography-oriented. It is about Alien, Aliens, actually, the, the second movie of the second installment of the, the franchise. And so we, we try to incorporate as much as possible that universe in a, which, which also was kind of hard because it's also like three songs, but we use samples and, you know, other recordings and also songwriting wise we would try to give it a lot more breadth and depth because you compare that if you compare that to our older records our previous records that which are kind of much more straightforward in terms of you know sonic assault uh death metal all that kind of stuff so we're moving towards a more cinematographic kind of soundtracky death metal and uh it's, it's going well man very nice, very nice. What is noticeable, definitely, you have a very unique sound. How are you getting your sound gear-wise? What are you playing on? I have the uh, Dark Plus B7K. Uh, I've been using that for uh, quite a few years now, I think three, four years. And then I applied that directly into another Dark Plus, which a lot of friends have been telling me that it's kind of odd, but it, it's got a very nice result. I'll keep using that which is the alpha micron, uh, like the small pedal, mm -hmm. then straight to your compressor, noise suppressor, and yeah, well, tuner, whatever. But I also have this very handy cap simulator, it's a more, cap, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly, it's, it's a very small thingy, I think Cradle Phil has been using that too. And it, it, it adds so much more low end to my overall tone, as you probably figure out, I I'm, don't play through an amp or like a head or a cabinet. I just use pedals and I go straight to the mix. I just wanted to get a set, like a sound gear was, which was as efficient as possible and also very uh, portable and handy in terms of, you know, flying and touring. And it, it, it works, man. It's so much easier to move around with that rather than... Uh, you know, with a cab or a head, a head. And uh, so, yeah, that's pretty much um, what I played through. Got you. Now, your bass, you're playing on a Valenti five string, if I'm not mistaken. Correct. Tell us more about this bass. This is a really interesting instrument. Oh, yeah. So, I approached Luigi Valenti, guitar maker, that, um, you know, with this proposal. He, he hadn't started for like too long. He had being around probably like for a few months. He had two, three guitars m made. But um, I don't know. I, I was struck by the uh, precision and sound of his very early guitars. And I, I think 
you just made one base or probably none at all. So I went to him with my older black heart, like custom base, which was this very cool but also local brand for metal instruments. That I, I don't even know what, what, where they went or what. But I think it kind of disappeared. But yeah. anyway. That base actually was was kind of it played nice. It felt nice. So I, I just straight up went to him and like, so you see this bass guitar? I just wanted I want you to make one, which is exactly like this, but like ten times better. Yeah. So we were sitting at this coffee shop and working the details. You know, he already brought with him this form. Okay, what kind of what would you like? What kind of string are you using? What about pickups? So it's um, it's an ebony fretboard, and the the, the body it's black lima with uh, I think it's flame ebony on top. Hmm. So oh, can I like take it real quick? Sure. So you see, like it's to it's like an ebony top on a on a very solid black lima. Oh wow! And uh, yeah, it's ebony fretboard and maple neck, and it's hey, it's so it feels so light. Even though it's very massive, <laughs> I yeah. think the bridge, the bridge per sale is it weighs almost one kilo. It's funny because it, when he told me, it was like, "What?" It also helped me a lot with balance because, uh, like, I was telling—I think I was telling you before—it's it's kind of a long guy, and it's a thirty-four inch scale mm -hmm. base. So, like, I'm sure you probably can see from there, right? It's like this this long this longer than you know most of the bases that i've been using so yeah the sustain is is incredible raul you, you would play a note and then, then it would resonate and ring for like ages the feel on the fretboard it almost feels like because i've always liked to play with relatively low action but you know just this tap right before it starts buzzing annoyingly because I, I like a little bit of you know uh fret buzz because I like to hit the strings real close to the neck. Yeah. So you, you got this very like high resonating clanky sound. It's very bright. So that helps me. The, the, the weight setup it helps me a lot with my own playing. The, the you know the, the feeling of my playing and also the, the overall tone. So yeah, and um, it's definitely the, the, the best bass I ever played. And I'm not saying that because I'm endorsed by Luigi. Yeah, it's, it sounds great. So a couple of things. Noticing you have a fret wrap on yeah. your on your at the neck, and there's a constellation embedded in your fretboard. Tell us a That's little correct. bit about that. Yeah, it's a Scorpio constellation, if I'm not mistaken. Because I was fascinated by Luigi's take on astrophysics and space, and on you know celestial bodies. Because uh, he named this very first guitar I think Nebula. So I was like, well, we could definitely keep up with it uh, in terms of naming because we were also thinking about making this bass a custom one, a signature one. So if other bass players wanted to have one as well, which surprisingly happened actually. Yeah. Because <laughs> I'm just, a, you know, uh, an Italian guy that plays bass for a <sighs> death metal band. I'm not that famous, right? But actually the, the, there were other bass players that the one is a, a bass exactly like that, it just uh, had a, you know, the, the, the color was different. But anyway, yeah, so we decided to name it Antares. Yeah, the, the, the line, the general line of the base, it's Antares, which is this, the, the bright star of the, the, con the Scorpio constellation. And now we named Scorpio with the five instead of the S, it was, yeah, fine. And uh, so, yeah, that's, that answers your question. Yeah, that's, yes, that's yes. exactly a constellation on, um, on the fret, and it glows in the dark. Same wow! With the uh, fret dots on the um, on the fretboard, because uh, and that's very useful because when you if you want to play like all cool and you know get on stage at the start of the show when it's all dark and then all the lights start uh, at the same time to show it, you start playing. But if you don't have that, and like oh, oh, which note am I supposed to play right now? So and before the start, um, you know, before the start of the show, I would have this little like flashlight and start pointing at the fretboard <laughs> like okay okay this is a, go faster go faster yeah that one. But, um, yeah very cool and what kind of strings do you have on your bass at these guys right here it's um elixir stainless steel 45 
130. And um, yeah, I mean, what they say, the, 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 the longevity is great. I, I've been playing this strings for like sometimes months without really having the need to change it because of maybe there were times that I wasn't on tour and but I would still play bass of course or learn songs or just you know jam mm -hmm. and you you wouldn't know the difference sometimes I even forgot you know the last time since I had changed them and like I was telling you before maybe when you change them for the first time you don't get that sharp right sound such as with the Daddario or DR or Anibal which are incredible brands which I've been using which I had used before switching over to Elixir but Elixir are so much more consistent in terms of of course durability and also like performance wise you know on a single show it's, maybe it's just me and convincing myself about it but you know, after like a week or 10 days of, the, you know, been playing strings, they, they kind of feel better. Like the, the tone, it feels like broader, mm. like it's, it's a wider and it, it, it responds so much better to your fingers. So, yeah, it's my way to go. There you go. Well, that's quite different than a lot of strings where players will say it comes out of the box bright and then they die. And so then you have just blub, 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 blub. And depending on the music you're playing, like if you're playing reggae or ska, you know, dead strings are perfect. That's exactly, yeah, the, yeah, exactly. That's the sound it's you want. Like kind of gummy, like rubbery yeah. feel. Uh, the, the low end uh, the definitely, definitely helps. But yeah, that's a, definitely a, a good observation because with death metal, especially our style, like which chorus features a lot of fast notes, complicated riffs, and when you have the drums like playing super fast all the time and then the guitars are so aggressive not to mention uh, the vocals right you always want to make sure that your sound cuts through the mix the right way yeah so you gotta find a good compromise i think and i try to mess with my highs a bit because I, I i like my sound bright mm -hmm. but at the same time i'm still playing bass so you also want to give the audience and the band on stage as well that kind of, you know, gutty, low, low end feel. So I kind of tried to reach this in between setting, both here on the uh, bass EQ and on my pedal board. So I would say, you know, the regular like inverted V shape where you get a little bit of you know, a lot of mids and then uh, not so many lows and highs. Mine, I would say, be pretty much like that because uh, I want to pump the highs up a little bit and without overdoing it too much. So I have the cap simulator to have the low end resonate a little more. It's complicated because I'm not really an expert of gear. So I always have uh, sound en engineers help me with that. But mm. it's bright, it's fatty. It's distorted, but not in a messy, very confusing way. So it, you get a lot of clarity. It sends out so much in the mix. It feels perfect. Nice. Well, and Does if that you make sense, what I'm saying. <laughs> oh, totally. Well, and if you think about it from a purely mathematical point of view, all of these variables that if you change one little thing it can have a ripple effect that changes so many others. I oh, mean, your choices so of pedals, the wood in your bass, the strings you use. It's like knowing the combination to a safe that if it's not all... So many variables, dude. Yes. Like, <laughs> and and it's so insane. it's not as much, I think, even the technical side. It's the auditory part where you go, this sounds the way I want to sound. And, and that's really how you get there that's true is all that all that matters so moving away from gear i know we talked about does the tour coming working on the album are there any other plans for the future for you and for your band probably entering studio uh, later next year and we're also working on a, a promo campaign on um for a very first video of our 
latest record, Simulacrum, uh, which was released in 2019, which kind of sounds out because the, the video clip was released three years ago. But I don't think it, it got like the views and attention in this era because we, we had this artist, uh, clay artist and uh, performance artist, uh, Olivier de Sagasson. Uh, he's a French experimental artist and, and, and then it's great. And we conceived this video clip almost as a short story, like a you know, a short movie. And so now we're being re-proposing like a little short clips from the, the backstage of that video. So working on that right now. And yeah, I, I, prob- I posted like the mid-term, mid-distance future, probably studio would be the idea. And also, a, you know, chances allowed for it, uh, we'd like to go back a third time to because uh, we just go back from a tour in the states with uh, hypocrisy and uh, Kirk Hangren and the agonist in April March uh, May that we have this one that we're talking to you about in September and then we would like to go back one more time before our visas expire because ah. uh, they only last a year and of course after COVID uh, getting you know one which is uh, sponsored by the book petition through, you know, the immigration offices of the United States, it takes, it costs a lot of money and time. Mm-hmm. So you just want to get the best and the most out of it. I and hear you. yeah, so probably more touring and, and studio sessions. Nice. And probably a video clip maybe. Also, I think, uh, yeah, probably we'll, we're going to be shooting a video clip before the end of the year. Still not sure about the song, but yeah, that's a possibility. Very nice. And if people want to know, because as we're talking about it, I'm sure the news about these things will come up. Where's the best place for them to look? Oh, Facebook and socials, uh, Facebook, Instagram. And you just, you know, look up Hideous Divinity on Facebook. That's, that's us. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's the best. Well, we keep the page pretty updated. It's, it's, it's very, you know, it's, it's, it's constant. The posting is uh, almost on a daily basis because you got to stay relevant. So, there's uh, no chances. Our manager will make our social media manager will all rest assured. <laughs> we'll make sure they you, you you're not gonna miss anything. So yes. yeah, that's the, the the best place to you know look into. Very good. Well, Stefano, we appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to chat with us, of course, sharing of course, the insights thanks. and all this exciting news, folks. You've seen him here, Stefano Franceschini, that's coming great. to that's you. Great, man. On Bass Musician Magazine, molto grazie. Oh, uh, grazie, grazie a te veramente. Thank you so much for having me here once more, and thank also to the rest of the uh, guys at Bass Musician Magazine. And it was like I told you at the very start of our conversation when I when I saw the email by our label PR Claire about the interview opportunity. I, I was stoked because uh, <sighs> I've been following you guys, and I always really wanted to have a chat with you. So, like, really, thank. Thanks so much for having me here. My pleasure. Again, molto grazie. You've seen him here.